Hi, today we've got another hot air station to take a look at. This time it's the Metcal HTT2 120. Now this model has actually been discontinued. The new model is the HTT2-200 and probably the reason why the previous model was discontinued is because this is only a 120 watt hot air station, so very low power. The new one is 200 watts and if you're a dedicated viewer you will have seen my initial unboxing of this. It's one of my first videos probably about six or seven years ago now and yes it's very niche in its use. So this has a super fine pencil for doing your hot air work and this is the largest nozzle that we've got, something like six millimeter orifice. It does come with a few others, I've put them in a little box. Those tiny ones don't really get used but this has been designed primarily for very specific use, particularly on, on mobile phones, tablets, that kind of thing, where you might want to re remove one chip or some very fine components and don't want to heat up the entire board. So quite limited in its usefulness. I thought it'd be a bit more useful than it was when I bought it. Uh, it's also extremely pricey. So I think this is coming in at about £450 for this unit. So very expensive for what it is and how much it's actually being used. Now this unit is quite a bit more modern than the HCT900 as you can see by the digital user interface. However, this one has possibly the worst user interface that I've ever experienced with a hot air station. Um, when you change the temperature, in fact the handpiece needs to be out, when you change the temperature it increments in one degrees but when you hold down the button to expect it to ramp up it's just set slightly too long. It's almost about five seconds between pressing the button and it actually reacting and then it goes a little bit too quick. I don't know whether they've improved this on the HCT 200. I don't know if any of you follow but John Orbiter, I'll put a link to his video up here, has the newer model, the HCT 200. I don't know if he covered the uh, user interface on that one but this one is really frustrating. Fortunately you rarely have to modify that. In fact on this unit I tend to find that I have to send, set it to 400 at least for it to be useful. Now this unit has extremely low airflow rates compared to the likes of the best and the quick hot air station. So this one maximum airspeed is seven liters per minute and the minimum is just one point, you can see how slow it is, um, the minimum is 1.5 liters per minute and there is one thing that I really wish that they had implemented when it starts to cool down it doesn't ramp up the fan speed when you put it back in the cradle. That means if you have it on one of the lower speeds, it takes absolutely forever for it to cool down. It's not really a huge problem. It's just that they could have ramped up the fan speed during cool down to get that element to be down to 100 degrees a bit quicker. If you compare that with the best BST863, when you put it in the cradle, it just ramps up to 100 liters per minute, the maximum airflow, and cools it down within about five seconds, no matter what the temperature is set to. So we're just doing a quick temperature test here. You can see it's not quite getting to the set point at the end of the nozzle. It is pretty stable and that is one thing that I found about these Metcal stations. It does stay very stable, it's just that the set point is slightly incorrect. Presumably because it's reading the heater temperature rather than the airflow temperature at the end. I guess they could try and calibrate for that. Let's try turning down the airspeed and see if this overshoots. and so the temperature seems to be dropping so that does imply that it's reading the temperature in the heating element and not trying to do any external calibration. Let's see if it remains stable once it's settled. So it seems to have settled somewhere around 290 degrees. You can just see it oscillating very slightly but only about two or three degrees at the most so pretty good in terms of stability. It's just that it's a whopping 80 degrees out compared to the set point. Now I've just swapped out the nozzle, you might just be able to make it out of the bottom for one of the finer ones and it does bring it a little bit closer in the output temperature to what it's saying on the display. Let's see if we still have as much discrepancy at the lower speeds. So as you can see, even with the smallest nozzle we're still quite a long way out. It's about half compared to what it was before, it's about 40 degrees out as you can see here. What is notable about this unit is it does have very good stability, it's just that the calibration is not correct. So this unit does have a very lightweight 
handle. It's very precise. You can hold it basically like a soldering iron and you can be super precise with where you point in the airflow. The handpiece itself is very lightweight and it comes with a nice length of flexible tubing. So very low user fatigue when you're actually using it. And you can actually get nozzles that are curved at 45 degrees so that you can use it like this that blow on top of a component. The unit itself is plastic at the front and at the back and then it has quite a heavy weight section in the middle that's made from metal. Four feet on the bottom and at the back we have the IEC connector, a four millimeter lead for grounding your ESD mat or your handpiece and then the rating label at the back. Also I'm not sure if it's showing up, you can just about see a fan in the back here which suggests that maybe, and I haven't considered it, but it probably is, that heating element may well be a low voltage heating element. And this has an AC to DC converter in here, which is driving that heating element rather than running it from the mains. So the construction of this unit is really, really good. This is exactly what we want to see in a piece of quality equipment. We've got the IEC connector at the back, going straight into a inlet filter. So we've got our filtering on our AC for EMC reasons. That wiring then goes straight up to the top PCB which looks like an AC to DC switch mode power supply that they've designed. Then that goes down and feeds into the control PCB at the front. We've got our Brutus DC motor in this unit here which is also for soundproofing but the wiring comes in just here and then gets the air gets fed out into this arrangement at the front which goes out to the handpiece and then you can just about see the wiring coming out there straight into the PCB, no messing around. And you know, this is really nice. So very easy for them to assemble, very little chance of anything going wrong during assembly. Very nice indeed. Ah, thing of beauty, joy forever. What we can also see is this front panel is all low voltage, probably 24 volts. That does mean that that heating element, presumably these two white wires, is a 24 volt extra low voltage heating element rather than a mains powered one. So I don't know what they were thinking, but everything is pluggable. As you can see, we've got plugs everywhere to remove the AC to DC board. And then they've soldered the earth lead onto the PCB. And you can't get to the terminal at the bottom here to undo it. So they must have fed the PCB into place, poked the wire through, and then soldered it as a last thing. And I don't know why on earth they've done that. They've got the three terminals here where the AC comes in. Why don't they just carry the earth with the AC connection to the board. It's absolute insanity. But uh, that's the only criticism so far that we've got of it. Let's have a closer look at this really nice looking PCB. So we've got really quite a nice PCB here. So the mains coming in straight into a clunky power switch. We've got our metal oxide varista for surges. We've got a nice filter in addition to the filter that's already fitted in the unit into two massive capacitors here. So that's where we've got our rectified mains. Then we've got, I, mean, I couldn't find it at first, but actually this is the switch mode controller chip. It's quite a unique device. I've never seen it before. Let's have a little look at the data sheet. And here it is, the Fairchild FS7M0880 power switch, 66 kilohertz operation, so relatively low frequency operation. Here's the internals of the unit, so it's a fairly standard switch mode controller chip, but it has the transistor built into it. And you can see they've got an example diagram here which looks very similar to what they've implemented on this PCB. So here it is, the mains coming in, we've got the filter arrangement, bridge, large capacitor, straight into the power switch with a few components around it. We've got the actual transformer just here. And then there's no additional components really other than the single winding. We've got feedback from this optocoupler just here, but very simple output circuitry here, uh, basically just rectifying it filtering it and then we've got our feedback network with a TL or a KA431. So here we can see we've got the optocoupler just here. Interestingly no safety capacitor between the input and output so presumably the output is earthed at some other point to provide that feedback path for any switching noise that's coupled itself across this very nice and large transformer. This is the MC33035 which is a brushless DC motor driver chip and we've got our six transistors on the side here, two on each heatsink and those are for driving the brushless DC motor. So they've rolled their own um, sort of design here for that and we can see that they've actually got a connector from the main board for controlling it. So we've got power, VCC and ground, then we've got the speed, start stop 
and then we've got the sync speed and then the fan which is to drive the fan that's on the back panel. So we've got a little two-pin connector here which is actually blowing onto these transistors so presumably when it reaches a certain temperature the main board commands the fan to turn on and therefore actually starts cooling those transistors. So I can't quite get the camera in at any better angle than this but we've got a very nicely designed front panel PCB an 80 mega 16 here is the heart of the control and everything else on the board looks very nice indeed. So we've got our little bar graph display, you can just about see the row of pins for the bar graph on the front panel. Uh, we've got a power MOSFET here for driving the heating element, so it is getting 24 volts DC into this PCB. And uh, it looks like we've got a little ribbon cable here which is going to the membrane panel on the front for the up and down buttons for fan and temperature control. But really a very nicely designed PCB and what I do like is that the construction of this, other than that earth wire, appears to have been completely streamlined. So people can just, in the assembly line, just plug in the various connectors. They're all unique connectors so there's no possibility of plugging something into the wrong place. So they've really got the manufacturing on this down and it does look very nice from what I can see. And here's that fan at the rear, you can just about see the MOSFETs behind it, so these are blowing directly onto there for a bit of additional cooling. So yeah, that's the Metcal ACT2-120. Unfortunately, I think this one, I was hoping I might be able to upgrade the heating element, but given the power controller chip that they're using, it does look like it's limited to about 120 watts, so no upgrade path for me for the heater in the handpiece. And as it stands, it does have very limited usefulness. It's certainly not the type of hot air station that you'd buy for general purpose soldering. It's for when you've got a very specific task. And testament to that is the serial number on the back of this unit, which is number 179. So presumably production of these units is relatively low because it is only going to appeal to a very small audience. It is a very nicely constructed piece of equipment, probably the nicest that you'll ever see in a hot air station. And I do think Metcal is probably the best brand for soldering equipment out there. The MX5200 soldering station, which I have, I've never used anything that compares to the power and the quality of that unit. It is similarly built like a tank. I've never actually opened it up to see what's inside, but it's a very nice unit and I have very high confidence in it working for a long time. Now, as I said, this one is probably the most expensive and most useless soldering station out there. In the next video on the hot air stations, we're going to be looking at a quick soldering station. You may have seen it in my feed, the 861X, which is the extra high power model of the very famous 861DW. And it'll be very, very interesting to see whether there's any changes inside or whether it's purely just a different heating element. So that should be coming up later in the week. Hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, thanks for watching.